Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wicked Podcast. Today I'm talking to Paola Diana. She is the founder of Artemite Recruitment and the host of the Game Changer Podcast. And I talked to her a lot about women's equality and women's careers in business. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Sandcaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code, Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat. Wicked podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wicked Podcast. Today we're here with Paola Diana. Welcome, Paola, Paola, and thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, as usual, we start at the top. So, please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an author, I'm a podcast host as well of Unleash the Game Changers, I'm a mother, and I'm a women's rights activist. So um, you, I've watched some of the episodes of your podcast in particular, um, you built a very impressive conversation about women in business or in their careers uh, around a variety of industries. Um, tell us a little bit some about that mission, that conversation, and sort of maybe some of the highlights and sort of key insights of uh, that area of content you've been producing? Well, I interview game changers, uh, people that I uh, consider inspiring and uh, disruptors in their own industry, in their field, or also, you know, in the si breaking cycles in life, breaking with traditions or the cycle of silence. And uh, this variety really inspires me and gives me a lot to think uh, because uh, every episode is different, uh, every guest uh, is unique. And I'm truly grateful for their time and their uh, you know, will to tell everyone their stories because sometimes you know, it's difficult. We had, uh, as an example, Claudia Duval. She's a, a war champion, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, who declared... Uh, while she was being interviewed, that she was abused and by the master of a, a former academy. And it was a huge thing to do for her because uh, she, never you know, she never told that to anyone. Um, but I felt uh, very happy that she felt she, so secure to let it go and, and tell her truth. Uh, I feel secure because, you know, many times women are not... Uh, believed, not listened to, and so they don't speak up. So I'm, I'm happy to provide this uh, safe space for them to speak. Uh, I don't interview only women. I interview the majority of my guests are women. And you know why? Because I want to change the the dynamics. Because I, I was a podcast uh, um, listener myself for, for many years, and I noticed that so the majority of guests uh, of the famous... Uh, male hosts were men and uh, nothing against that of course there were incredible people uh, but i thought so you know what maybe also women need the same visibility uh, and i think that uh, having a, a female host will, will give uh, them more light more space and this is what i'm trying to do yeah so uh i think it's a really great mission that you're on and um so in terms of then the you talked about the safe space of that and i think that is probably true in other areas as well, not just for for women in in society's context, but also for for other people, minorities, and so on. So, in terms of safe space, so you 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 managed to successfully create that in your uh, podcast. Um, what's what's your wider view on safe spaces and how we can maybe then therefore create them or how we can contribute to those? Because it seems to be a bigger topic of safe spaces for people to speak out be able to do so. A lot of organizations try to create those in organizations, but often are quite challenged and are failing on that. What sort of your sort of insights into 
how this can work best in terms of set up that a safe space and how we should go about it. Well, it is fundamental to have people telling their stories because we know that's the only way we can really learn how is reality among us. And also we need to, um, we need to believe in free speech and we need to uh, let people talk freely, particularly if they're talking about controversial topics. We all know that now uh, there are some uh, toxic Uh, conversations uh, and some people are even scared to tell what they think about that and one of those uh, debates are considered toxic is uh, the debate around gender ideology uh, and I started studying the topic because I wanted to know more myself and that's why I interviewed a few experts on the topic I precisely have six guests Uh, on Unleash the Game Changers, and I created a special gender ideology section where people can understand a little bit more what it is. And you know what? Being a female uh, rights, women's rights campaigner uh, since uh, many, many years, is what I, I remember, <laughs> since I can remember, really, I, I noticed that, unfortunately, uh, many of the requests of activists pro-gender, uh, they clash with women's rights, mm. uh, particularly with girls' rights and children's rights, because we notice uh, a surge in uh, uh, girls who now believe and declare that they are transgender. Mm. Uh, and of course, it, it wouldn't be uh, so worrying if it was just believe, but we, we know that they then tend to do some physical changes and uh, use cross-sex hormones and other type of drugs that can bring irreversible damage. So for sure, we have to talk about that. And for sure, as a women's rights campaigner, I have to be worried about that. So I don't really understand, and I definitely don't approve uh, people who want to uh, silence me and also the other incredible activists who are doing an incredible job because these people they're just pro women <laughs> they're not against anyone they're just pro women's rights this is what they are and this is what i am so i i believe that we have to give not only safe spaces to people to declare their truth uh, even if it's the truth that maybe once was considered shameful and hard to tell but also people to tell the truth and to tell what they think, their beliefs, their philosophical beliefs, their religious beliefs. You know, we, are, we live in a time when we're not uh, forcing people of different religions to believe in one single religion, thank God. <laughs> uh, so why don't we let people express themselves also on this particular topic of gender? Uh, it shouldn't be so toxic, you know. We should definitely be able to talk and uh, uh, and explain why we are so worried about it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's 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 interesting. You mentioned that kind of trend where, oddly enough, even so, we're just breaking all open new ground, or you know, we're becoming a bit more inclusive. But at the same time, in other areas, we're building new silos. Unfortunately, even often of people that shouldn't be, that should actually agree with each other rather than disagree with each other because of trying to define their own well, we, we, resource. Exactly. We should agree to disagree, at least, uh, without uh, attacking each other, particularly personally with toxic uh, uh, attacks that are horrible. Uh, I really despise trolls online who were just there to offend other people, uh, to trash them. That, that is disgraceful. And also, we should really go into deep into meaningful conversations and try to understand each other, apart from the superficial slogans. It's good to be inclusive, of course, but it's, it's also good to defend women's rights. <laughs> it's, it's fundamental, I would say. And also children's rights, because as a mother myself, I, I know that when you are a teenager, you are confused. You can't really make uh, decisions about uh, being sterilized or renounce to body parts. It's kind of dangerous because 
we all change our minds. We were teenagers as well. It's a, it's a sort of madness, right? When you're a teenager, you don't like your body changing, particularly for women, it's very hard, right? The society wants us to adhere to certain stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a very, uh, it's a very tricky time in our life. I think we should, uh, uh, we should help teenagers to just accept their body, accept themselves, love themselves, and then eventually, when they are older enough make uh, uh, irreversible decisions yeah so when when i listened to that and i just interestingly i was talking with a friend of mine a few days ago about similar thing where essentially you know as a male and i'm not i'm not thinking the highest of my own gender very often uh, given some conversations that are going on or some influences that are <laughs> out there and it's just really nowhere near of i mean it's just appalling to, to kind but as you said when women grow up, it seems to be just so many more complexities ahead of them of who they are, who they should be and what's asked of them and figuring out how much they should care about it, how much they shouldn't care about it. Whereas men sort of are often just given a very simplistic or don't have to try that hard to, to do the same thing. Um, and then at the same time, and that's my question. So when you then see, you know, we're both, we're both running on social media, we have podcasts. They're great platforms for a good message, but they're also very dangerous for this black and white and toxic influencers, people like Andrew Tate and all these guys where, you know, they're absolutely the appalling side of the spectrum, but end up having millions of followers to the level where some young boys are now quoting this guy in the classroom and people get absolutely scared about it, how much influence a single person can have and that the, the, the real thing I I found, the real conversation I had with my friend was, I don't understand that. I was mainly raised by my mom. My dad was not really there. But that doesn't necessarily mean I was lack, I was lacking being able to identify how a man should behave. You know, the, 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 the basic principles of respect and all of that should be there. Do, do you think that sort of breaks through still enough on social media? Or do you think it's sort of... You know, it's like any other tool, it can be used both ways. Well, uh, is it contributing or is it mainly that? Should we just switch it off or should we have the, these conversations in other places in order to have a better conversation? I tell you the truth. I, I, I think that social media are quite toxic in general, uh, particularly for young ones, particularly for teenagers. Uh, I would definitely suggest them to just switch it off erase your profile unless you're making money out of that and it's different in my opinion in my case i i keep social media only because as an author uh, writing my second book at the time at this time i know the publishers like to see uh, the author with a public profile and also as a campaigner i like to spread you know some messages and uh, yeah, and give a voice to my uh, ideas and the ideas of the people that I interview. But I, I definitely use social media as an instrument, a pure instrument. I don't let them influence me in any possible way. I don't let them me take too much of my time. I use them when I have time, only uh, in a rush. Also, I have a social media manager who is helping handling them. Uh, but of course, I'm an adult. Right. And I, and I have a certain type of personality, so I know I can do that. Unfortunately, talking about vulnerable children, particularly the ones in this uh, autistic spectrum, they can be seriously affected by uh, social media and by the news they find online. Absolutely. You know, if everyone would know how to handle them as what they are, an instrument to do good, it would be fine. But unfortunately, that's not what's happening. And I, I fear that teenagers feel much more pressure about the way they should look. Also because in social media, almost everything is fake. Let's remember that. Uh, the filters are terrible. You can look like, a, like an actress, a model, whatever. It's all unreal. Uh, the people dancing in front of the screen and then they commit suicide because they're not happy, but they fake to be happy. So why on earth we are doing that? We should share something real, right? We should share something that could help other people to cope with life, to cope with reality. We have to be very, very careful uh, to this uh, fake side of social media. I, I, I 
truly believe it's toxic. So I would definitely use some sort of regulation for the young ones. Yeah. 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 I mean, and there's, there's, I don't know if you're aware of the book, what was it called? Um, Get Rich or Die Lying about some of these influencer culture and about fast fashion and um, surgeries and anything. And it's a, it's a pretty dark leap into the really, really negative side of what that does to people and how industries build themselves around it. But in terms of, uh, it's maybe bringing it back to um, you a little bit, because yeah. I, I noticed someone when someone interviewed you about your book, you said, you know, it's great when people approach you and that your book helped them so much. Um, so you are, you are a role model. Um, how do you find it sort of in terms of people being able to relate to you? Is it sort of does it work well for you or do you feel sometimes that can be a bit of a hindrance in terms of you know people who in particular might have some challenges and then they see other people who seemingly have broken through this do you think it's it's often easier to connect with them or do you think it sometimes also makes it a bit harder in that sense to sort of connect and and, and reach out or that they can reach out because you probably had a couple of conversations when people approach you well i think listen to the podcast and so on yeah 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 absolutely uh, particularly of course girls uh, and women who, who writes to me that I, I i inspire them i inspire them to take more care of themselves to to change career to think more about their self well-being instead of just giving, 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 and then, of course, become drained by this uh, behavior. I, I'm so happy when I can empower uh, a woman, but, of course, also a man. <laughs> if that's the case, I, I'm totally pro-man in the sense that I'm, I'm a feminist that consider men our allies, of course, the good ones. <laughs> uh, and I think that we need them uh, at the front line with us. Yeah, no, absolutely. You Thank know, God. we have to. We definitely need to We're not differentiate. Yet. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I definitely. <laughs> I actually call them the enlightened ones because I think a man, when he is enlightened, he understands that there is a problem in society uh, that is caused by male violence, that is caused by you know other men, and 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 this type of man, they understand that they have a responsibility that they should speak up for women against misogyny every time they hear something wrong spoken by one of their friends or peers. You know, uh, I believe that sometimes, particularly boys, right, young boys, they listen more to their peers than to their parents or their teachers. So each one of us has a responsibility, 100%. It's not a women's problem. It's a problem of the whole society. And particularly when uh, men become uh, fathers of girls, they understand that they have to make this world, this society, a better one for their daughters. Because if not, one day they will face the same discrimination, the same abuse, the same dangers that we are facing now. So it's a collective effort to make this society a better society. Uh, and definitely we need compassion and empathy uh, for everyone who is struggling. And, and I think sharing our stories, uh, as I do, right, many times, so through my books, so through my interviews, um, my speaking uh, events, it has nothing to do with uh, myself, just myself, right? I, I'm doing that because I hope my story can, can give a glimpse of hope to someone else who's struggling or can give uh, uh, an inspiration to someone else who is maybe undecided on what to do in a certain phase of their life. So I always think uh, about us as a collective, you know, that I, I think each one of us should support the other. And I strongly believe in sisterhood as well. I, I believe women should do more for other women, uh, not being jealous of each other, but actually trying to uplift each other because that's the only way to, to go for, forward. Absolutely. And I, um, you know, I have a, I have a 10 year old daughter, so I'm going to be very, I'm very wary and looking sort of both forward and with some wariness towards the next four or five years when she's becoming a teenager, because I, I grew up in a small town and she's now growing up in a big city. And, uh, 
I don't know what it looks like for a teenager because I never grew up in a big city as a teenager. So it's going to be interesting. And um, But I'm trying to um, get the conversation a little bit more into organizations and women organizations. So I'll start with a quick and simple one because we had a really great session in the last project I worked in at WPP last year. We had a really great session of women in leadership. So all women in leadership there sort of came together for a session to just share their experiences over their career. Um, so short question to you is do you ever do you ever suffer from imposter syndrome ever because a lot of smart people seem to be doing that and it came up there i know i know i know the, it exists uh, thankfully it never happened to me <laughs> i i think i have a very high self esteem and yeah. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm very, I feel at home in every environment. Yeah. Uh, I definitely know my value and how much I can take to the, bring to the table. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. And you, you're one of the few lucky ones because I, I know it was, it was really revealing there when we had that conversation that some of the people like on the sea level really said, look, you know, I have it too, I work through it. And just because I appear like this doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Everyone has their moments when they doubt themselves and it's just how you deal with it. And I think it's it was it's always nice to hear a bit more deeper into how people deal with that with certain uncertainties. Um, because just you know, it's just it, it's I an know. easy one to connect to. And it's you know, it's amazing how how high performing people like you and others really do that because we had we had a, we had a, um, we had someone on the podcast from uh, West Point, the military academy. And he's teaching NBA quarterbacks about confidence. And you would think that an NBA quarterback doesn't need an inch of confidence more than they already have because they're at the top of the game and whatnot. And even they have, so it's, it's interesting to see that. Um, but then when we uh, dig maybe a bit more into... Yeah, but, uh, you know... Sorry, go on. I know if I, if I if I can go back one second to... If I can get, uh, go back one second to this, uh, um, I think... The people like me who are founders, sole founders, of course, of their own, you know, uh, enterprise, uh, and who made everything by themselves. Mm. I think we, we we need to have my, you know, personality. Yeah. We can't have the imposter syndrome. If not, you could never build anything because it's too hard. It's too yeah. hard. Also, I started my career in Italy. It's a very patriarchal society. Yeah. It was uh, really hard <laughs> if I think about now, but of course I, I, I couldn't see the obstacles at the time. Uh, but definitely you need to be particularly strong, particularly focused and particularly uh, self-reliant uh, and, and be your biggest fan. I, I was always my biggest cheerleader. Even when people around me weren't, believing in me I, I couldn't care i don't even listen to the voices you know around me yeah. that it's just noise it's just people who fear and uh, yeah so i think that's why i never developed this syndrome <laughs> no it's, it's impressive i mean look you know some of the the, the the most impressive female leaders i know you know sometimes have that but i think oh, it's interesting you say you have to build things from yourself by yourself nearly by yourself you know, whereas I think a lot of people I meet are in bigger organizations, so, so they always have way more people around them. It's a very different context. It's a different size context. Or they don't have to build things by themselves. They have to rely more on maybe other people sure. to some extent, and that might actually create a different dynamic, which is super interesting to know. Um, so, so, so taking that on board, um, one thing I observed, and obviously because I'm male, I never really looked at it, really from the other perspective i haven't actually never asked someone but i observed myself often being in rooms with a group of people and at sometimes it's just men in the room and you have a particular dynamic and a particular type of conversation or, or the conversation just takes on a different temperature right for lack of a better word but then when you start having even one woman already makes a complete different in the, a difference in the room right suddenly things shift differently sometimes they come a bit more collaborative sometimes they just come a bit more maybe not not as competitive as when you know men are just amongst themselves um but when you get a better and better mix it just really is interesting how it changes what's your observation on those kind of dynamics when you know you say look there's actually a major benefit to have more women in the room and here's why and here's that and here's that do you have some of those observations uh, yourself 
I totally agree with you. Uh, women can make the difference in a group. That's why diversity matters. And we, we need to have diverse groups uh, in our companies, in the boards, uh, in politics, for sure, 100%. Uh, the dynamics change, absolutely. Uh, the, the, even the language, the way re you relate to each other changes. Uh, I think women can bring more sensitivity, more compassion, more empathy. Of course, we're not all the same. I'm not saying that all women are angels, by the way. Uh, there are also uh, women who can be bad individuals, uh, of course. But there are some similarities in, in the values that we cherish the most. Uh, and, and we know that uh, women tend to be more diplomatic, tend to be less aggressive, particularly physically aggressive. Of course, they, they can be aggressive in, in a different way, uh, unfortunately. But, but the tendency uh, is that they, they can be definitely more diplomatic. And uh, in, in a group dynamic, that makes a difference, right? Because there is less friction. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have a different relation with sex. Uh, we, that is a very important part of our lives. And also in the way we are socialized nowadays because there is porn online. We don't talk so much about that, but it's a huge problem, particularly because, uh, uh, again, young uh, um, people, uh, and particularly boys, uh, they, they just start watching this very early on. And they think this is reality. They think they have to behave like that. And unfortunately, porn online is very misogynistic. Still nowadays, it's quite violent towards uh, the, the woman. Uh, again, it's very toxic. And I think it's, uh, we shouldn't be allowed uh, like it is now to everyone at every age. We should have, uh, um, we should have an age uh, limit because it, it can really change the way a man perceives a woman. It can really change the way a man respects a woman. Yeah. And then, of course, it will change uh, many ways, you know, in, in the way, on the behavior of the man. Uh, and then behavior of different men together, right? This pack of, um, of men who can actually go very wrong if they're not stopped, if they don't stop one second and say, okay, we shouldn't behave like that. We should respect women. Yeah. So having women in the groups, I think, will help them to respect them more. And I think it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that. So a lot of the areas I work in is building teams around better problem solving. And better problem solving teams normally are made out of the more diverse they are, the better they actually are at problem solving. And there's a Google yeah. study as well that where they looked at all their teams and said, you know, we want to find out which, which ones are our best teams. And it's not the ones with the most specialists in them. It's the one where actually everyone listens to each other. So regardless of that, it's just these basic principles, you know, that actually the voices are all heard and then you can de-risk better because you looked at it from very different angles. And there's also in one of our previous episodes, I don't know if you know the book by Karen Cornwall, um, You Can't Fix What You Can't See, which also looks at the different characteristics of the genders and how they can bring these in and she said you know the future is probably more female because the more complex problems we can only solve through collaboration and listening and i think women are inherently to some level better than that or they definitely bring a vital part to that that males just don't have that much they're good at other things but for that stuff you really need more shift to the other side which is a very interesting concept um so we always have well yeah and also, also we need to embrace more our feminine side yeah absolutely so sorry, sorry. <laughs> i know we have a, we have a slight we delay that's why we're sounding a bit rude to each other by nearly talking over each other too much we're not it's a delay it's the tech um unfortunately we always have more questions yeah, yeah, than exactly. we have time. <laughs> so here comes the last one uh that might open up a bigger thing, but let's see if we can contain that a little bit. Uh, tell me a little bit about your book, uh, Saving the Planet. Sorry, I didn't hear you. My book, my next book or my, my published book? The published book, please. Yeah, so uh, my book uh, uh, is called uh, Saving the World, Women, the 21st oh, the world, Century sorry. Factor for Change. And the title, 
the title itself uh, uh, it's very bold <laughs> but i think it's very true because i think uh, women can change this world and are saving the world in the way that before they weren't allowed outside the household right we're talking about centuries of history of course millennia but now finally not only they are allowed but they are reaching the top in many sectors we still need a critical mass of women, particularly in politics, uh, and then in finance, uh, in uh, universities. Uh, but definitely they will bring a different type of leadership. Of course, I'm talking about women who are not just imitating men, uh, because that's never a good idea, in my opinion. Yeah. But if they bring to the table their personality, also the, their own experiences, because growing up as a woman and going through all sorts of difficulties and discrimination and sometimes also abuse and violence can really change the way you perceive the world, society, and also can give you different priorities. Uh, and then even the laws, this critical mass of women uh, that will deliver, you know, there will be different laws. And they will impact in the daily life of all of us. So I truly believe that this will be the case. Uh, not only technology is changing our worlds, but also the role of women in society. And I'm fascinated in studying more uh, this uh, uh, factor for change, particularly in sociology and through history. Wonderful. And uh, what's the next book about? You mentioned that earlier. Do you on the next book? My next book, it would be about breaking cycles, but I can't specify anything more at the time, but I hope I can come next time here to present my next book. I think that'd be great. That'd be lovely. So um, thank you very much. This was very insightful. It's very exciting talking to you. Uh, so I say thank you for your time and uh, being with me today. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Till the next time. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com. Mm-hmm.